Yeomans. Donald, is that you? Yeah. So Donald also has an asteroid named after him. It's number 2956. And it turns out that these near-Earth objects are the only natural hazards we face that have the potential to directly affect every individual on the planet. It's the only thing that puts our very existence at risk. And Donald's responsibility and the responsibility of his group is to um, monitor and catalog the estimated 2,000 asteroids and comets that approach Earth and have a diameter greater than one kilometer. So my question to you, Donald, is if you spot something up there, maybe Richard's asteroid that got its trajectory wrong coming its way, what the fuck do we do? <laughs> Good question. Well, as uh, Moses has pointed out, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about near-Earth objects. I'm going to tell you, first of all, what they are and why on Earth would you care. Uh, near-Earth objects, it's easy to define. They're objects, comets and asteroids that can get within 30 million miles of the Earth's orbit. Some of them get much, much closer. And uh, the second part of the issue is uh, what I call the brother-in-law question. I have a brother-in-law who pulls me aside from time to time and says, hey, you NASA guys are spending millions of dollars in space. It's my tax dollars that are paying for it, so what's in it for me? That's the brother-in-law question, and that's what we're going to try and answer today. <laughs> Jack, would you put, introduce the folks to uh, Michelle Knapp and her 1981 Chevy Malibu? Uh, Michelle is not a happy camper. The back end of her car has been destroyed. The insurance company says, no, we're not paying. And mumbled something about an act of God. Now, it wasn't so long ago when my teenage daughter was living at home, so I think I know how this conversation between Michelle and her dad went that evening. Uh, uh, dad, it's about the car. It's been destroyed. The back of it has been destroyed. But it was not my fault. You see, this big rock came out of the sky, and it just sort of pummeled into my car, and that was it. And the old man puts down his newspaper and says, yeah, right. Well, that's exactly what did happen to poor Michelle. The peak scale meteor of October 9th, 1992, came down over uh, upstate New York. It started out as a Volkswagen-sized object above the Earth's atmosphere. The pressure as it went through the Earth's atmosphere on the front side was so much greater than the pressure on the back that it pancaked, fragmented, and most of the fragments burned up in the Earth's atmosphere except for one, which landed in Michelle's trunk. It's about 27 pounds, the size of a football, so we shouldn't really feel too sorry for Michelle because she managed to sell the car and the meteorite for $69,000. <laughs> yes! <laughs> now, let me introduce you to Mr. Semenov, who was sitting on his front porch almost exactly 100 years ago today when another near-Earth object disturbed him. This time it was an object about 40 meters in diameter, came down over... Uh, Russian Siberia. Again, it detonated above the Earth's surface, created a equivalent energy of 12 megatons of TNT. Now, just to put that in perspective, two megatons of TNT is roughly the energy equivalent of all the bombs dropped in the Second World War. What happened? It came down and leveled trees for 2,000 square kilometers. Fortunately, this was a very uninhabited uh, region, so all that happened was that uh, Mr. Semenov was knocked off his porch and his shirt was, uh, felt like it was on fire, but he survived it. Some reindeer didn't, but had this uh, event occurred a couple of hours later, they could have wiped out St. Petersburg uh, in Russia. These near-Earth asteroids that destroyed Michelle's car in 1992 knocked Mr. Semenov off his porch 100 years ago and destroyed the dinosaurs 65 million years ago. Where did they come from, and how were they delivered to the early Earth? Well, here's, here's an artist's conception of what the solar system might have looked like 4.6 billion years ago. In the center, of course, the sun is forming. In the inner solar system, where it's relatively hot, you've got bits and pieces of rocky material 
that are agglomerating to form the planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, the rocky planets. In the outer solar system, where it's much colder, of course, you've got icy bodies that are agglomerating to form the major gas planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. So if we wish to study the chemical mix from which the solar system formed, you'd like to study comets and asteroids, because they haven't changed much in the interim. They're very primitive objects, and so one aspect of near-Earth object is they represent the bits and pieces left over from the solar system formation process. Now, when the Earth was forming 4.6 billion years ago, it was very hot, of course, because the, there was a hellish environment of impacts coming in for the first 700 million years. This was called the late heavy bombardment. And after all, this is how the Earth formed. Asteroids would come in and form the Earth. It would be larger and larger and larger. But the upshot of that is that the, the water and the carbon-based molecules that are necessary for life to form could not have survived in significant quantities. So we've got a bit of, dilemma, a bit of a dilemma here, because after the uh, late heavy bombardment let up some 3.9 billion years ago, the evidence for life was about three, began about 3.5 billion years ago, and some folks think it was even sooner, 3.8 billion years ago. So basically, as soon as life could form on the Earth, it did. That leaves us with a question of where did the water, the carbon-based molecules, come from? Well, they probably came from subsequent collisions of comets and asteroids with the Earth that provided much of the Earth's water and this veneer of carbon-based molecules that allowed life to form. And water, carbon-based molecules, methane, ammonia, are the building blocks of life and we probably owe our very existence to objects that have provided these uh, materials to the early Earth from near-Earth space. So that's another question, or uh, response to my brother-in-law. If it weren't for these objects, we wouldn't be here. And even more so, these objects, subsequent collisions of large objects, punctuated evolution, allowing only the most adaptable species to progress further. At the time of the dinosaurs checked out, 65 million years ago, the mammals were furry little creatures burrowing underneath the ground, staying out of the way of the dinosaurs, no doubt, but they managed to survive. They were adaptable. It was Charles Darwin in the 19th century who pointed out it's not necessarily the strongest of the species that survives. It's not necessarily the most intelligent of the species that survive. It's the most adaptable species that survive. So we not only owe our existence to these objects. We owe our preeminent position atop the world's food chain. Let me explain to you why this object, called Apophis, it ruined my Christmas in 2004. <laughs> it was discovered in June of 2004, and because it was difficult to observe, it was rediscovered in December of 2004. And we quickly made some calculations, which is what we do at JPL, um, and computed the orbit, matched the observations in, in December of 2004 with those earlier in June, and that gave us a long data arc, as we called it. So we did an orbit, integrated that orbit forward in time to see whether it made any interesting close approaches to the Earth. Well, it does in 2029, April 13th, Friday the 13th. <laughs> now, initially, it had an impact probability of 3%. We found that out two days after Christmas in 2004, and that's what ruined my Christmas, because this is a 270-meter-sized object. Were it to hit the Earth in 2029, it would be a 500-megaton event, which is another a, a way of putting that into context. So that's a Hiroshima-type blast every second for 10.5 hours. It'll be a naked-eye object, 3.5 magnitudes, on April 13th, 2029. Mark your calendars. <laughs> now, the interesting part of this is if the object were to pass through a very tiny region in space, which we call a keyhole in 2029, some 600 meters in extent, it will return seven years later and collide with the Earth on April 13th, 2036, which turns out to be Easter Sunday. All right, what do we do? 
Well, NASA has as its current goal to find 90% of those near-Earth objects larger than a kilometer, objects that can cause a global problem should they hit. We've, we've currently found 81% of them, and we're well on our way to finding most of these objects. None of them are a threat in the short term. But these things are a very diverse uh, population. Uh, the near-Earth objects range all the way from wimpy ex-cometary fluff balls, objects that you could actually tear apart in your hands, to rubble piles held together by little more than their own self-gravity, to shattered rock, solid rock, to slabs of solid nickel iron. So you've got to deal with that whole spectrum of structures. And so you would treat a fluffball comet much differently than you would treat a solid slab of iron, of course. So you could run into it. Uh, that, that would be a mitigation technique. You could uh, put up a reflecting mirror that would focus the sunlight on the front side of the asteroid, ablate the material so the material would come off in one direction and introduce a thrust in the opposite direction. So you could do any number of technologies to, to stop these things, deflect them from hitting the Earth if you find them early enough. And of course, that's, that's what NASA's goal is, is to find the vast majority of these objects soon enough that we can do something about it. It's the only natural disaster that you can actually do something about. So as we look at uh, Comet Mc McNaught, seen in January of last year in the Southern Hemisphere, let me review um, just why these objects are important and what is it I am to say to my brother-in-law. They represent the bits and pieces left over from the early solar system formation process. So if we wish to study the chemical mix from which all of us formed, we'd like to study asteroids and comets. Comets and asteroids delivered to the early Earth much of the materials, the water, the carbon-based molecules, the methane, the ammonia, all of the building blocks of life. So without them, we wouldn't be here. Subsequent collisions of these objects with the Earth punctuated evolution, allowing the most adaptable species to progress further. So without them, we wouldn't be where we are. Uh, I would be talking to a group of large reptiles instead of... Uh, Mammals were it not for near-Earth objects taking out our principal competition some 65 million years ago. For our future, we're going to utilize these objects uh, for the materials to build space structures. We're going to utilize the water with comets and some asteroids for sustaining life, for providing rocket fuel. So these things are extremely important for our future. And finally, we're going to try and track and find the vast majority of these objects and perhaps mitigate a few of them so that they won't collide with the Earth. And that has to be done if we are to have a future at all. Thank you for your interest. I have one small concluding thought for you. If it turns out we survive the water crisis and then the food crisis and then the oil crisis, the epidemic crisis and the near earth crisis, we are told reliably that if nature is left to its own devices in only 7.59 billion years from now, Earth will be dragged from its orbit by an engorged and angry sun and spiral to a rapid and vaporous death. In the end, there won't even be any fragments. Robert Cannon Smith of the University of Sussex, who made these new, even more precise calculations, called his new forecast, quote, a touch depressing. <laughs> <laughs>